So it's going to take people a little bit to get in here. So we've got our speaker. Uh, this is Nelly Deutsch, and um, we're going to wait for uh, people to come in. Hello, Anna. You made it first. That's great. If you could just add in the chat box where you're from. And um, there's Anna. Anna was a speaker, I believe, on the first day of the um, of MMVC 1-4. Okay, so my people are going to be coming in. Uh, there's our speaker. I think you look better in real life. Um, <laughs> I hope the sound is working. Uh, yes. Okay, there's our speaker um, in the background. So we're in the United States now. We just uh, got back from Sweden. Not everybody made their flight. Some uh, missed it. So it's taking a little bit of time uh, for everyone to get here from Sweden. But as you can see, people will be coming in. So a little bit about uh, our presenter. Professor Michael Edelstein, Edelstein, if I said that correctly. And um, this is just a little bit about the countries. I'll talk uh, later about uh, countries and uh, the roles that people have. Um, Mike is an environmental psychologist who does amazing work. And I think that it's time that people learn more about uh, what's available and how to uh, live a more healthy and healthier and more sustainable life. All right, so people are coming in. Uh, I think that uh, we can get started. I need my fingers on the O oh, on the other um, computer so I can invite people who are missing out. So how's your, um, you want to try your mic and see if it's working, if everything's okay in the background there? How am I sounding? Oh, fantastic. Wow. Good to have a good sound. And notice, everybody, it's still green. Uh, we're, if it gets uh, red, don't, don't worry about that. It just means that uh, it's our collective internet connection that might be weak. All right, so hello, uh, Ludmilla. We've got Tom. If you could just add where you're from so we get a sense of um, the globe. So Ludmilla is in the United States. Nevis is in Italy. Um, what other? Venezuela. Greece. Canada. Okay. Okay, so I'm t taking away my uh, webcam and voice. All right. So uh, whenever so, um, whenever you're ready, just I'm going to get started. Uh, I appreciate your joining uh, me this morning. Uh, at least uh, New York time. It's uh, still it's afternoon already. Um, so good afternoon. Um, we are here to, uh, to actually preview a MOOC uh, called the Healthy and Sustainable Living MOOC, which we're going to do in September. I understand that you just heard a whole presentation on MOOC, so I won't uh, go in that direction um, at this point because you know what we're talking about. Uh, but what's interesting about uh, the, the MOOC as a, uh, a technique is it opens up the possibility of really exploring are um, fairly innovative, even in the traditional institutions of higher education, and to actually uh, do some path breaking and to really uh, bring some content that, um, that not only is important for people to learn about, but important in terms of what people think about in terms of the conduct of our laws. So, uh, so welcome to uh, a kind of a preview of a uh, charting the path to a sustainable future, a discussion of an upcoming MOOC called Healthy and Sustainable Living. 
I want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues uh, in uh, putting this uh, MOOC together. Uh, they may look familiar to you if you have been involved in uh, this uh, this program and others that uh, Nellie Deutsch has done. Uh, and uh, Nellie's constant uh, uh, colleagues, Ludmila Smirnova, uh, the two of them have done a great service to people all over the world in bringing excellent online content uh, and creating an opportunity to learn the technology, but also the content. And it's, it's a pleasure always working with them, and it's exciting that we've teamed up to, uh, to actually produce this coming MOOC. I also want to acknowledge my, uh, my colleague, Ashwani Vashif, who uh, is uh, helping put this together. Let me just say that I teach at an amazing uh, college, Ramapo College of New Jersey. I've now been there for 40 years. And I stayed there, and I actually I went there to begin with, because Rampo was set up as an interdisciplinary college along different lines than we find in academia um, through most of the world. And it's allowed us to do innovative things. I've taught mostly in the environmental studies program, uh, although I'm an, a psychologist, uh, and more recently in our Master's of Arts in Sustainability Studies. And the MOOC that I'm talking about will actually be coming out of the Masters of Arts and Sustainability Studies, which we call MAP. Uh, and I just want to say one word about it, because it represents the kind of program that you should be aware of that deals with the content of the MOOC. We offer a two-year intensive master's program. It's very broadly based on the notion of sustainability studies rather than some particular topic within it. Uh, we mix online and face-to-face -face, uh, classes. We have a diverse faculty who draw from the social sciences and the sciences as well as business. We also have a global and diverse student body with very different interests. And they develop capstone projects around their interests as a, a platform both for their practice as sustainability practitioners and also as a platform for further study. If you want to know more, uh, the website is rampo.edu backslash math. And uh, so uh, the content of the MOOC uh, will heavily draw from some of the things that we work on in the math program, and we've worked on it around for, for a very long time, really developing uh, the notion of sustainability, which has developed in parallel around the world and become really a driving issue. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, for this particular presentation, I don't want to spend a lot of time on sustainability itself. I'm going to talk about the MOOC, but just in case you're uh, not familiar with the concept, uh, I am talking about here what I call jokingly, the Bigfoot dilemma. Uh, Bigfoot, if you're not familiar with it, is a mythical creature that some people believe exists uh, and leaves big footprints around every once in a while to remind us that uh, he or she may actually exist. Uh, the Bigfoot dilemma I'm talking about, though, is about a dilemma that um, also leaves big footprints uh, that we don't pay attention to mostly and most of us don't believe exists, but really does exist. And that's uh, what people refer to as our ecological footprint, or the demand that each of us, particularly in the developed countries, are making on an Earth that actually far exceed the capabilities of the Earth both to produce resources and also uh, to assimilate the contaminants that we produce. Um, sustainability is very fundamentally based on the notion of a carrying capacity or an idea that within some range, there is a certain amount of demand that any environment can support. And if we overshoot or go past that demand very far, as we do in modern society, we risk a crash. And that crash can be very catastrophic. And so the crises that we see in the modern era with our, our way of doing things, uh, in a lot of ways, have to do with us pushing way past our limits and seeing consequences that are, are in themselves catastrophic individually, uh, but collectively they uh, represent the potential for massive catastrophe and massive demand for change. Uh, much better is an environment where people and uh, others make demands that are more of an S-curve, uh, where the carrying capacity is not exceeded very much, where there's a lot of feedback and adjustment to try to maintain some balance between what the capabilities of the environment are and the capabilities of the demands placed on it. Now, um, in sustainability, we tend to look at three realms, both of crisis and opportunity. 
The first is society. And by looking at the social crises that are occurring in modernity, whether we're talking about uh, war uh, and the horrible things that are going on in the world right now, uh, and seem to often be going on in the world, whether we're talking about the inability of uh, societies to address issues ranging from population to equity uh, to uh, opportunity for uh, people in poverty. Uh, there's a whole set of social issues that uh, we have crises around. And a lot of those crises also cross over into the tightly interconnected realm of the economy. Uh, we've undergone worldwide uh, many economic crises. Those crises are tied in some way to the notion of overshoot because the world economy is heavily based on the concept of, of unlimited growth. And unlimited growth is just another word for overshoot. And then the third realm that we deal with in sustainability is the environment. And the extent to which we combine environmental crises, economic crises, and social crises uh, is really um, the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, trio of issues that we deal with. And we often look at them as separate and separable issues. But in fact, these are issues that uh, uh, are tightly interconnected and, in fact, not separable uh, at all. Um, uh, Ludmilla Miller's reminding me that uh, when I talk about uh, the big foot or the the, the large uh, uh, overshoot uh, in terms of our ecological footprint, that we should be focusing on our hands, not just our feet, and that the, the future is actually in our hands. And in a lot of ways, that's what the conversation is with sustainability. It's about how we actually deal with that future. But in order to get there, we need to be able to see the crises and the need to change. And one of the, the real interesting issues for me as a psychologist is the extent to which we wear blinders, uh, we have uh, mute buttons uh, and earplugs, and uh, by and large, we have cut off our connection to the crises around us, and uh, we have limited ourselves to a, a frame of vision and reality, uh, which is very divorced from what we need to pay attention to if we're actually going to make the changes to a sustainable society that are urgently required more urgently every day. Perhaps because I'm a psychologist, I tend to really be interested in then what the fundamental dilemmas of sustainability to me are about, which is why, why do we keep acting the way we do if we know it's bad for us and our progeny? Uh, what are the conditions that disable our ability to engage in necessary change? And what are the remedies that overcome resistance and enable a sustainable change? So in my own thinking, I tend to go in the direction of trying to answer these questions or to give them a great deal of thought. Um, now, much of sustainability is reactive. But as we'll see, a lot of it is also proactive. And the reactive parts of sustainability have to do with the fact that we are so much an overshoot and we have the crises of our social, economic, and environmental world as a result. And so with sustainability, our goals are to get us to shift to a, a, a way of living where we live within the interest of nature's capacities for renewal, regeneration, and assimilation. That means that our activities uh, can be based on the productive capabilities of, of, of verdant nature rather than uh, digging into fossil fuels and go beyond that. Uh, it means that we are always regenerating that capacity and that we don't overtax or expect more than to be delivered in terms of assimilating pollutants that we may create, uh, which if they cannot be assimilated, then become a problem for all living things. And we do that rather than living in a way that rests on irreversible expenditures of natural principles, the kinds of uh, resources that can't be replaced, so, so uh, not renewable. Secondly, we need to think about meeting the needs of people today without sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This definition is probably the most cited definition of sustainability. It comes from the Brundtland Commission report, uh, and, uh, which is a, a key document in the evolution of sustainability thinking. And it, it begins to think about sustainability in a way that isn't based on just carrying capacity thinking, which is more scientific. It was really based on our, our human urges to have children, to take care of those children, to believe that the next generation will lead a better life than we have led, 
uh, to uh, to have hope. And how do we actually meet our needs today without sacrificing those future generations' capacities to to also lead good lives? This is really a more complicated question uh, than it looks at to be at, at the surface. It's, it's a very deep question. <clears throat> Thirdly, um, there's the issue of global equity and how do we create equity of resource access and of wealth by reducing overconsumption but also enabling sustainable livelihoods. And this has been a major focus of sustainability thinking and action. Uh, and obviously, we're not really there yet. We have a long way to go. How do we avoid phantom dependency? Uh, the notion of a phantom dependency comes from uh, Catton's work on overshoot. Uh, but basically, he very cleverly suggested a long time ago now uh, that the reason why we can prolong acting in a state of overshoot, that we can uh, rely on resources that, in fact, are finite and that um, aren't uh, renewed, is because um, uh, those resources actually are phantoms. We believe that uh, we can have a growth society based on resources that we're actually using up and won't be there in the future. Uh, the idea is that somehow they'll always be there. It's that, that notion of a, a, a ghost or phantom capacity that drives our whole modern system. Uh, it's a fantasy. And um, the reality is, is that we're relying on resources that uh, when they're gone, they're gone. And um, we will have uh, created a society with a, a dependency and a vulnerability uh, that is a fatal one unless we actually begin to shift the basis of society to a more re renewable foundation. Another point is how, we, how do we avoid irreplaceable losses of species diversity, critical habitats, beauty, and, and broadly, nature? I was just reading this morning an article about how um, uh, butterflies are, uh, are disappearing uh, because, in fact, uh, the uh, food that they rely on uh, is the, the plants that produce that food are now considered weeds and are being destroyed worldwide by herbicides. And uh, so we have a crash of butterfly populations. But how do we actually avoid these irreplaceable losses? How do we avoid pushing irreversible limit conditions? Uh, the limit conditions are clearly uh, limit conditions like climate, uh, where once we have tipped the climate in a different direction, as we may already have done to some degree, um, we begin to uh, create limit conditions for ourselves. Our ability to keep the Earth habitable becomes less and less. We have much more limited conditions to live in. And that's what we, in fact, in sustainability thinking, in a lot of ways, are thinking about is how do we create uh, a world in which we are not uh, constrained to living in a way that, in fact, uh, is not uh, conducive to happiness and a good life. So my computer screen went off, and I just make sure what page I'm on here. So how would we summarize sustainability? Um, my own summary. Uh, sustainability is the perpetuation of human and other life on Earth. So it's about perpetuating life under conditions of minimum stress through the intentional balancing of Earth limits and human demand. Dynamically achieved by creative and responsive learning societies, societies capable and engaged in learning. They're engaged in promoting the mutual health and renewal of people and productive ecosystems now and in the future. I see various notes uh, as I'm talking, and they're all uh, very uh, responsive to, uh, to what we're saying here. <clears throat> so keep, uh, keep thinking. Um, now, there, as I said before, there are also proactive goals of sustainability. Sustainability is not just about uh, creating the crises, uh, creating a solution to the crises that are confronting us in a faulty modern system. Um, it's also about creating a better way to live, a, a way to live that's more satisfying, uh, that works from the standpoint of sustaining us, but also makes us live better with less. And a lot of thinking and sustainability goes in this direction, and it's proactive. It's what I call the happy side of sustainability, as opposed to the unhappy side. <clears throat> so while assuring justice and equity 
Uh, can we improve the quality of life for all while avoiding wasteful consumption? We already know we can. Uh, we know we can reconnect people to nature and to the verdancy of nature if we try. So we can reconnect people to each other and to human support and to, to feelings of love. Uh, all that's good about uh, society and community, we can do that. Excuse me. We know that we can promote happiness, uh, joy, and delight. So we can engage in lifelong learning and personal growth. So we can create a sense of security as opposed to the drastic sense of insecurity that so many live in today. So we can create conditions of safety uh, that are far different than the conditions of danger uh, and hazard and risk that so many live in. So we can build healthfulness into life activities in a way that so much of modern life is about being unhealthy. Um, we don't need to do that, and we know that. We can promote positive psychological conditions that are nurturing to us, rather than ones, than ones that are stressful and defeating to us. So we know that we can make these changes, and they're all part of sustainability, uh, but they're what the, the I call the happy end of the topic. So let me come to the MOOC and how we want to address this. But we'll be discussing these topics and many more at great length. And I want to give you the landscape because I think it's exciting and it'll make you want to join. And that's my goal. So this is MOOC. We first of all want to create an informative program for those who want to learn more about worldwide sustainability and how we can make a transformation from the conditions we're in now to a sustainable world. That's a topic. And that's, that's actually also our goal. We broadly want to frame issues that can explore um, not only the topic during the MOOC, but can create a framework for each participant to explore these issues in the future through additional online programming, through educational programs like our Masters in Sustainability Studies at Ramapo, through independent learning and action, uh, through actually the learning that occurs in neighbors and in communities. We want to demonstrate an educative but also a communicative process that's useful to furthering the sustainable transformation through sharing successful models and concepts by networking, by planning action, and also by reflecting and assessing. And doing this at the local all the way through the global scale. What's really exciting here is the potential to connect these different uh, levels of social process into one. And that gets to the final point, uh, the notion of a newosphere, the uh, idea that we can actually be transformative by creating a global shared collaborative realm of thought and sustainable consciousness that will be a next stage of evolution in the world. The thought and consciousness that we've created in the modern era is the opposite of that. But working together, we can move in the direction of a sustainable thought process that we share, and this kind of global connectedness by uh, online technology actually allows us to do that in a way that it was virtually impossible before. So it's really neat. So how are we going to do this? Uh, well, we created this MOOC, and the way it works is that every Saturday in September, there's going to be a keynote address. It'll be followed uh, on Sunday by a panel discussion. It'll be on the same theme. They both will have some opportunities for discussion and questioning. Uh, but that will expand even more during the week because uh, people who participate will have readings and activities, uh, some relevant videos, people will post uh, posters and uh, have some input during the week that they share. Um, and uh, there'll be a lot of cross questioning and discussion among participants using asynchronous online posts, using external blogs, websites, whatever gets created, uh, we will really try to get you not just attending a lecture, uh, but really engaging the material in a way that isn't just um, abstract, but actually gets tied into the way that you live, the way that your community is going, and, and the way that the world is going, and how you can make that happen. So uh, the six weeks of the MOOC flow roughly like this. The first week is logistical and some introductory stuff. Uh, we 
on the second through fifth, the fifth week, we have four themes. The first theme is making a sustainable transition. There'll be a, a lecture and there'll be a panel. The second theme is making change at the global scale. One of the interesting things is I'll explore in a moment that's happening and it's been happening is the possibility of global discussion that um, are about things that in the end are rooted locally. And the third thing really gets back to those local roots. How do we create local place-based sustainable community? Uh, and the fourth thing is looking toward a sustainable and healthy future. How do we actually make that happen? So um, uh, the final week is logistics. Uh, if you are actually participating in the MOOC, to get a certificate, you have to submit stuff and wrap it up, and uh, that'll all happen in that uh, that last week. So that is the flow. Uh, the first speaker, <laughs> this guy looks familiar. Now I thought I looked better in person than I did in the picture, though, I guess. Let's see. Anyway, uh, I'll be talking uh, in more depth about how we make a sustainable transition, why it's necessary, what the prices are that are driving it, what disables us from making the leap in that direction, and then the transformative change is actually occurring despite all the roadblocks uh, everywhere. Um, as Nelly pointed out when she introduced me, I'm an environmental psychologist, so I come at things in kind of a different way. Uh, I, as I've noted, have taught for 40 years in the programs in environmental studies and sustainability at a small interdisciplinary college in New Jersey, a state college, Ramapo College of New Jersey. I also am president of a non-governmental organization, Orange Environment Incorporated in Orange County, New York. My expertise broadly is around issues of the psychosocial impacts that affect people who are exposed to human-caused disasters. A lot of my work deals with people who live in contaminated environments, chemically contaminated nuclear incidents, um, unhappy situations for sure. But I also deal with large-scale and small-scale uh, disasters that are human caused of other kinds. I just did a lot of work, for example, on the Aral Sea disaster in Central Asia. Uh, beyond looking at what I call the unhappy side of sustainability, the things that tell us we've got to do something different, uh, and working with the victims uh, that are produced by the way we currently do things, uh, I spend a lot of my time working and thinking about the challenges and approaches to implementing a transition to a sustainable alternative paradigm. Uh, first of all, we need to write that paradigm. It needs to exist, and we need to chart the transition. A lot of that is happening. So much of it is exciting, and we need to actually understand that and participate in it. I've done a lot of writing and uh, thinking, um, probably best known for a book called Contaminated Communities. Uh, my most recent books are Cultures of Contamination and a book called Disaster by Design of LC and its lessons for sustainability, which uh, draws on that work I mentioned in Central Asia. Um, so the panel to follow me, I, I drew from some of the amazing people that uh, Ludmilla and I met uh, when we uh, supported a, a wonderful event that occurred last September in the New York region uh, called the International uh, Women's uh, Earth and Climate Summit. And they pulled in a um, hundred of the most amazing activists from around the world. Um, and so I got a chance to hear and meet and spend time with uh, people that uh, I, I just really admire and who are actually doing what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, I've stayed in touch with some of them. And uh, some of them have uh, uh, agreed to spend some time with us uh, in this panel on the MOOC on the second substantive uh, day. Uh, Carmen Catrillis from Bolivia is a, a global actor, but uh, she's also a person who is really bringing uh, climate awareness and uh, response uh, to, uh, to major regions of South America. Uh, Phil Hussein is from the Maldives. Uh, she heads an organization called Voices of Women, but she's dealt with a wide range of issues relating to climate and sustainability. Um, Nima Namadamu, uh, hopefully we can get her online. I'm not sure yet, but um, uh, she has been doing uh, amazing work 
uh, with an organization called Hero Women, uh, bringing sustainability to, uh, to Africa. Uh, Pasang Doma Sherpa is in Nepal. She's actually a lead uh, climate uh, professional and activist in Nepal. Uh, I have the pleasure, among a number of things, uh, now working on her dissertation, which is on uh, preparing people for climate change. Uh, it's wonderful to work with her, and it's going to be great having her as part of this panel. And Hindu Omaru Ibrahim is an amazing woman from Chad who has really been working on sustainability issues in a deep way in Africa and um, can talk about this in a way that really brings home what the issues are on the ground. Uh, there's a question, where are the men? There are men later in the program. But you know, it's interesting. Um, the, uh, a lot of women step to the front on these issues. And they do an amazing job. And there's a whole discussion that occurs about whether, in fact, the modern era has been so dominated by men and male thinking uh, that it's time, in fact, for women to step to the front. And of course, in many parts of the world, women are restrained from stepping to the front. So empowering women becomes the major goal of sustainability. So um, where the men are. We'll get to some. Oh, here's a man. OK. Um, Anyway, uh, we go on to the second keynote, and uh, we are so fortunate to have uh, Felix Dodds uh, talk to us about making sustainable change at the global level. Uh, Felix is a long-term famous um, futurist. Uh, he is broadly a scholar of global sustainability, and his scholarship is based on having been there and done it. Uh, currently, he's a senior fellow at the Global Research Institute at the University of North Carolina is also an associate of the Telus Institute in Boston, which is one of the major sustainability think tanks in the world. Uh, in the past, he was executive director of the Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future for a long time. He was the chair of the NGO Coalition of the United Nations on Sustainable Development. And he's co-authored a lot of materials that are major books and uh, uh, documents about how you make a transformation to sustainability at the global level. Uh, one that just came out uh, last week is this plain language guide to Rio Plus 20, preparing for the new development agenda. I should note that uh, the United Nations Conference on Environment held in Rio in 1986 and followed up 20 years later, uh, a few years ago, uh, was a, um, a, a major step uh, toward uh, a global consciousness and really set the global sustainability agenda moving. And Felix is in the center of that. OK, uh, so we will hear from Felix with a keynote. And we will follow Felix up uh, with a panel that, uh, of people that I've, I've got a chance to spend a fair amount of time with who are just amazing. Uh, and they are uh, male. and uh, they indicate a, a male consciousness uh, that is about creating a sustainable world and being a wonderful model for doing that. Uh, the chair of this session will be my colleague Ashwani Vashit. Uh, Ashwani is originally from India. He is a, a planner uh, by profession. He's also an architect. Uh, and he works on, um, uh, particularly on issues of how one brings uh, an ecological um, and environmental balance into human sustainable activity. Uh, also on the panel, panel is Rasadan Maharaj from South Africa. Uh, he is the chief director of the Institute for Economic Research on Innovation uh, in the Faculty of Economics and Finance at uh, Swanee University of Technology. He's also connected to many organizations, uh, Global Network for the Economics of Learning, Innovation, and Confidence Building Systems is one of them. Uh, Rasajan is a major thinker about uh, how one creates change at the global level. Uh, someone that I have um, I really uh, spent a fair amount of time with because he's at Ramapo quite often uh, is Achita Desloza from Sri Lanka. He's the executive director of the Center for Environment and Development. And um, he, among other things, is the creator of one of the most interesting global processes going on right now, which is uh, really about 
the uh, question of how one uh, creates citizens' treaties uh, dealing with sustainability. Um, and so uh, he is um, going to talk about that. Uh, Rick Clarkson is an American who has been at the forefront of many of the global sustainability actions from the Earth Charter uh, to the Tawar Declaration. Um, and um, he currently is with an organization called Spirituality and Sustainability Project Forum 21. And um, we have these comments here about gender. And it does work out that these are gender. Uh, I, I, I'll try and mix them up a little bit more. There, there were women invited to this panel. We'll see whether we can, we can add some of uh, it's not the case that men dominate at the global level. Uh, it's the case that uh, these are some amazing men who have played a key role at the global level. Uh, but when one looks at what's going on there, uh, one sees many women, including the people I have in that first panel. Um, and as we move to uh, looking at local place-based sustainable communities, um, we see um, a, a keynote from uh, someone who is a wonderful uh, actor making things happen around the world at a global scale, but dealing with local place-based uh, sustainable communities. She's uh, Kosha uh, Jobert from South Africa. Uh, she is the president of the Global Eco Village Network International, and she also directs the European branch. And um, Kosha is someone else I met uh, at the Women's Summit. Uh, she speaks very well, but she's got such incredible experience. And uh, she directs one of the most important organizations doing, uh, doing this work. Uh, she works as an international facilitator and trainer and consultant. She has this extensive experience developing curriculum for sustainability, but also uh, bringing about international collaboration and sustainable development. And uh, she has been a driving force between uh, behind um, eco-village projects that have been developing throughout Africa and the Middle East. Um, among her uh, impressive writings are the curriculum for eco-village design education, uh, a book called Beyond You and Me, Inspirations and Wisdom for Building Community, and a book uh, that was written in German, and this is our translation, uh, the Power of Collective Wisdom, How Do We Create Together What We Cannot Alone? I think uh, this is going to be a wonderful keynote uh, event. And it's going to be followed by a panel. Uh, we see here uh, two people, uh, one of whom uh, is already confirmed. Uh, but I have uh, many others in progress. And this is actually uh, uh, under construction. But the panel on making local change for sustainability already has um, a sheet Ashish Tosari involved. Uh, Ashish is the co-founder of an Indian non-governmental organization. Uh, and he's active on issues of conservation and biodiversity and equity and livelihood and indigenous rights. Uh, and has done amazing work in which he brings together all of these issues uh, in a way that really addresses local sustainability. Uh, and it's that thinking about localism that he's just really uh, important for. Um, he's written many books and articles. Uh, his books include Environment and Human Rights, a book called Churning the Earth, The Making of Global India. Uh, he's a major thinker. Uh, also from India, and I actually haven't talked to Sid yet, but uh, he will, I'm sure, participate, is Sid Artha. Uh, Sid Artha heads the Fireflies Ashram, which uh, our program in environmental studies has had a partnership with for many years, and we actually run a semester of a spring in India at uh, the Fireflies Ashram. Uh, and Siddhartha, besides heading Fireflies, uh, has a non-governmental organization called People Tree. And they have been working to promote sustainability and indigenous rights in India at the local level in an amazing way. Uh, and uh, we'll be adding uh, three more people to this panel. And so we will uh, get there. I, I see a comment about typos. I've been noticing them too. But they are more visible on the big screen, unfortunately. Well, here is um, a, a real wonderful uh, way of uh, concluding the substantive part of this MOOC.
Uh, I am deeply moved to be able to tell you that uh, giving a talk on a pioneer's perspective of moving toward a sustainable and healthy future, uh, we have the participation of Hazel Henderson. Uh, back in 1978 or 79, uh, I went uh, to um, a, a wonderful event called the Toward Tomorrow Fair. I took a whole uh, busload of students with me, and it was in uh, the University of Massachusetts. And one of the highlights of that event was a talk by Hazel. The first time I ever heard her, and I have just been wowed by her ever since. Uh, she is an economist and a futurist who has spoken very clearly and very plainly about a whole host of issues that, at the core, how our economic system undercuts sustainability and what we need to do about it. Um, back at that time, the book that I remember, uh, which has been reissued, is a book called Creating Alternative Futures, which was an amazing book of the 70s. And one of the things in this field that's interesting is that some of the strong pieces of work that were done back uh, in the period of crises in the 1970s that spurred us to really start thinking about sustainability in a major way, uh, a lot of those pieces of work are still very current. And, and you know, the details may be out of date, but the thoughts are right on. Um, Hazel, uh, more recently, uh, founded an organization which is president of called Ethical Markets Media. And so, uh, the second publication here is called Ethical Markets Growing the Green Economy. Uh, her most recent book is called Mapping the Global Transition to the Solar Age. What you see from Hazel is somebody who doesn't just talk about what the problem is, but she has played a key role in trying to make sure that we invest in our future the right way. And she's done that with some amazing success. Among the things she's developed with others are the Green Transition Scoreboard. Um, that was done with the Calvert uh, Fund and uh, an organization called GDP Alternative. Uh, she has a, a, a thing called the Ethical Markets Quality of Life Indicators and Principles of Ethical Biomimicry Finance. And um, those are all tools for actually figuring out whether we're doing the right thing or not. And uh, so um, I can't wait to see her speak with reflecting on what her thoughts are as someone who pioneered this field and is still active in it and uh, can really give you the long perspective. And then looking to the future, the panel that follows that is the future belongs to the next generation. And I could have peopled this panel with um, thousands and thousands of young people from all over the world who are stepping up to say that we're going to make the changes that the older generation could not make. We're going to actually do this. Uh, Sharing will be uh, one of my former students and someone I admire deeply, Amanda Neshawet, who, among other things, has been the UN rep for the Foundation for Post-Conflict Development. But she is deeply involved in uh, the global climate process and the global sustainability process at the UN, but she's also the sustainability officer for her local community of Secaucus, New Jersey, and basically she's all over the map. Uh, she's a key activist on uh, fracking and uh, tar sands, uh, oil, and I'm very proud of her. She, she definitely uh, is someone who's been recognized globally as one of the, the brightest young people out there pointing the way. I've also involved a, a young person I've worked with in the past a great deal, Jonathan Reisman, who is now an MD. And he, in, even while going to medical school, founded and became chair of an organization called the World Health Education Network, in which he's looking at how one addresses health crises uh, in some of the most crowded cities in the world and the most unhealthy places in the world in order to be able to facilitate a turn towards sustainability. Uh, he's another amazing young person. He's very young, but boy, has he accomplished a lot. That's true of uh, these others as well. Fadawa Belair is someone I met uh, at the summit in New York. She's from Morocco. Uh, she does sustainable development and climate change. She's the climate change uh, rep for Morocco and also for uh, a coalition of uh, Arab uh, uh, nations uh, for the uh, young people working on climate issues there. Uh, she's well-spoken, well-versed. Uh, she has degrees in business, and she is about making a business out of 
a sustainable transition, doing it the right way. Paul Rosalie uh, is, uh, uh, again, someone very much a part of my own life, one of my former students, uh, one of my dear friends. And Paul, even while he was a student, was uh, sneaking off every chance he could get to Peru, to the Amazon. And um, what, uh, what Paul uh, did is he founded an organization called Tamandora Expeditions, which is an uh, eco-tourist uh, organization that does more than just tourism. It really gets people involved in scientific and conservation projects in one of the most beautiful parts of uh, the Amazon in Peru. And he recently produced a book called Mother of God, uh, which I had a chance to uh, play a role in. And uh, that book is an amazing statement by one of our brightest young thinkers about the importance of preserving the Amazon and preserving the Earth. And uh, you can find Paul in uh, making movies that have won UN awards and uh, work, working now with the Discovery Channel to, uh, to do some very important work on the biodiversity issues in uh, the, the deep Amazon. Uh, Munira Subai is someone I don't personally know. Amanda knows her. Uh, but I've gotten to uh, know her by watching everything on the internet about her. And uh, she is a, a young woman who is uh, Syrian, but also uh, uh, American. And uh, she's been connected with an organization called Sustain Us. She's currently at the NASTAR Institute of Science and Technology, which looks like an amazing uh, green technology center in Abu Dhabi. And um, she is most famous for having made a speech at the um, Doha round of climate talks to all of the ministers in which she basically told them off for not being brave enough to do what needs to be done and basically said, well, the young people are going to step up and we're going to do it. And uh, she's all about change. Uh, I have not uh, a picture of Melanie Akashian, uh, but she's another person that Amanda has gotten to know, uh, who's an amazing young activist currently in Israel at the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, which is another amazing uh, place preparing people to do sustainability work throughout the developing and, and, and throughout the world as a whole. And this is going to be a very dynamic panel. The future belongs to the next generation. These people and many, many more are actually picking up where, to some extent, we dropped the ball, but we're going to move it as far as we can. But they're going to move it the whole way. And it's an exciting process to watch. So what do we hold in our hands? Um, well, there's an expression, we hold the whole world in our hands. And it's like this notion that the world is something that is humans we control. We can put it in our hands. On one hand, we have responsibility for it, but that picture on the right implies that we have control over it. And we don't, actually. Uh, but we play a major role in influencing it. And the picture on the left has a very different message, a message of nurturing, of being, feeling the soil, of feeling the growth, of feeling the regeneration. Um, and that's really the relationship that, uh, and sustainability, and the transition to sustainability, we want people to have that feeling. Because as Ludmilla pointed out before, the earth is in our hands, but not in a cold way, but in a way of nurturing and making things happen. A healthy and sustainable living MOOC in September is a step toward getting people talking the same language and thinking the same thoughts even more than they do now, sharing some of the amazing people that are working on these issues, uh, and basically, um, not owning this issue, but in fact, recognizing that this is an issue that is arising from the grassroots everywhere, that it's owned by everyone. We have to make it happen. And the only way of doing that is, as with the, uh, the open network that we're on, it's really allowing everybody to share and to uh, take responsibility. So look in September for the Saturday keynotes and Sunday panel discussions all through September. There'll be weekday readings, video, and sustainable actions for people who are actually taking um, the MOOC for a certificate. And certificates of participation will be issued upon completion of the requirement. So that's what I have to say. Uh, Nelly, if there are questions or comments, I'd certainly be uh, open to them. And um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you for your, for your time.
Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, it is so impressive. And uh, what started as a dot has turned into a globe. And hopefully um, this will be uh, a very meaningful and um, first of many such MOOCs so that uh, we can connect for uh, something that will improve the quality of our lives. And I think this is super important and we all share that. The only thing is, how do we get the world um, into the MOOC? And I think that's where uh, everyone has a role. Everyone who's here uh, is invited to invite their friends and um, colleagues, neighbors, everyone, so that uh, because together we can make a difference. Um, alone, it's, um, well, it's not going to go that fast. So um, I think this um, is a very, very important uh, challenge for all of us, and we should uh, do our best to move things. So thank you. Th I didn't know that Ashwani was also in um, Ramapo. Thank you, Mike. Uh, are there any questions or comments um, that you'd like to bring up? How do we enroll? Okay, there's a question. Thank you, Ludmilla, for adding the link. Uh, so, uh, Zoe, do you want to talk about the enrollment? Yeah, we've got the, uh, yeah, the link is there. Ludmilla has added that. Oh, okay. And um, questions above. What are the questions that got posted above? Uh, Ludmilla, I, I, if, ah, uh, where, oh, okay. Uh, if you have a question, could you put a question mark before uh, and ask your question. That'll make it a lot easier. Just add questions. Here's a question by Tom. Why can some countries buy others affluent? Uh, Tom, can you uh, explain or maybe it doesn't need an explanation? I'm not sure. I'm looking for it right now. Oh. Why can some countries buy affluent? Well, um, I, I, I think I can explain the question. Um, what, what happens is that um, if you talk about climate or uh, pollution uh, targets, um, instead of requiring uh, every country uh, to essentially come within the limits that they should have for not overshooting, uh, in this case, the assimilative capacity of the Earth, not overly or overly contributing to climate change. Uh, one of the ideas that has been in force for a while and has been reasonably successful is the notion of uh, selling uh, a carbon credits uh, or uh, offsetting. And um, that has uh, led to some very interesting things where, for example, a number of years ago, uh, I was able to attend a meeting in Russia of uh, non-governmental organization members from all over Russia who were coming together to meet with the uh, uh, Natural Resource Defense Council in the United States um, to talk about how they could preserve major areas of the forest of Russia by uh, getting paid through offsets um, from uh, the United States. And that same process has worked around the world um, it hasn't necessarily worked perfectly. In um, Ecuador recently, there was an effort to get the world to invest very heavily in a, a major preservation issue, uh, and uh, it appears to not have uh, come to fruition. Uh, but, uh, but the idea that, in fact, we would um, uh, concentrate on uh, preserving the areas that are, are the best uh, for uh, uh, stabilizing climate and for assimilating pollutants and carbon uh, has some merit. Um, at the same time, I also don't like it because it allows people to uh, exceed limits and it has a, a downside to it as well, particularly in the areas where plants may in fact be polluting. Uh, so um, I see a note here, uh, especially at primary schools, 
Australia has special cleanup days. Yeah, uh, as a way of getting uh, people involved. Um, it's important uh, to uh, to do those cleanups, uh, even though they, to some extent, are just dealing with the surface problems. Uh, but they do; they're very accessible for people to participate in, and they do make a difference. Uh, Earth Hour, and she is not interested at all. Well, I, I think you could find many young people who are not interested. Um, but at the same time, I think it's about culture, and I think that there are many young people who are interested, and the culture of young people uh, is headed um, in many directions. Uh, the world of consumption and the world of kind of trivial pursuits is out there, uh, but so is the world of really making a difference. And when you, if you come to the MOOC day when those young people are presenting, you'll get a sense that many young people, in fact, uh, aren't uh, indifferent to these issues. And it's really a question of setting up a youth culture that captures the rest. And that's something that needs to be done. So um, we have a couple minutes left. Anything else here? To that Earth Hour this year, uh, there's more hyper than my students. Well, you know, I've been, a, I've been an educator for 44 years or 43 years at the college level. I taught fifth grade briefly <laughs> and, and also Head Start many years ago. But um, basically, I've been at the college level. Um, and I have a great deal of faith in young people. I think that um, um, they have the possibility of continuing the problem, and they have the possibility of making a change and making a difference. Uh, we have to have faith that they will, in fact, do the second. But if they choose the first, uh, they're going to be the ones who bear the brunt of the consequences. So we need to get a situation of informed consent for them so that they understand the implications of the choices they make. Those implications have a much finer trigger on them than anything we ever had to do. Um, Thank our time. Sorry. Uh, Tom has copied the chat. So uh, we can get the questions and uh, we can actually continue the discussions in the course feed. Uh, Ludmilla, do you have the course feed ready there uh, for MMVC14? And then uh, we can continue the discussions. In addition, you're all invited to join uh, Healthy and Sustainable Living. Our next session, you're all invited. Mike, sorry, this is back to back. Not a good idea. Uh, I think that uh, this is the last year I'm doing back to back. It's um, it's not fair, really. Um, our next session is in Second Life. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Second Life, but you might find it interesting. It's um, teacher training. Oh, thank you, Tom. There's the link um, where we can continue uh, with uh, questions, comments. Um, and everything in between. And there's, thank you, Ludmilla, there's the uh, Healthy and Sustainable Living MOOC that is starting in September. And you're all invited, of course. So thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Edelstein, and thank you, Dr. Smanova, and uh, everyone for uh, joining us. And um, we'll move to the next one sadly, but all right. So thank you. Bye, Mike. Um, bye, Ludmilla. Bye.